On this episode of Crew Cut, we have with us Narain Chandavakar and Benedict Taylor. Cheers. 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 They have worked on uh, Urta Punjab, Son Chidiya, Newton, Killa, Ship of Theseus, Sherni, Patalok, Ghul, Gurgaon, Neil Bhatte Sanata, The Girl in Yellow Boots, Karib Karib Single, Trial by Fire, Leila or Sangeet, The Winter Within, Black Kite, which was nominated for the Canadian Screen Awards for Best Original Score. Uh, their work is featured at a variety of festivals, including the Rotterdam Film Festival, the Berlin Film Festival, Venice, BFI, Busan, Toronto, and at the MoMA. It's an exhaustive list. Uh, separately, Narain has worked as a sound designer on The Disciple, as well as done the sound design and composed uh, for a variety of plays. Benedict works as a violist and a performer and lecturer. He's composed for plays in London at the Royal Court, amongst others, and as a sessions musician with the likes of Apex Twin, uh, Madness, Bell and Sebastian, Jimmy Page, Donovan, and Jarvis Cocker. Good to have you guys on the show, guys. Good to, good to be here. Mm-hmm. Ah, let's get cracking. What do you like to be referred to as? Composer, I think. So, like, yeah, music. Yeah. yeah, so just like composer. Music. Like, yeah. What do you do? What is film music? <laughs> it's in the name, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, says it all. Yeah, says it all. So, as like a film, as film composers, you're responsible for all the m- music in a film or a series. That's not the songs. Mm-hmm. So, usually that that might be handled by you know a different team. Sometimes it's the same team, but we usually do what's just the score. Um, so that's everything apart from the songs in say something like an Uttar Punjab or something. Mm. Okay. Um, we're involved at different stages of the project. It depends on you know uh, how well we know the director, or how or what what stage we're brought mm-hmm. on. Um, but ideally, what would we like? What the process we most enjoy is when we come on at a script level, and then we're on board from there up until the last final deliveries for post, which is with final mix, and when the film finally gets finished. So through that process, you're sitting with the director, with the producers and um, primarily with the director and um, at a script level you're trying to find what the uh, musical identity of a film or series is Mm -hmm. Um, and usually what we try and do is at that point in time try and find what you know what the what what the music is what the role music has to play in the Mm. in the project so at that point in time we usually try and um, come up with a musical language for the entire thing and a musical mm. world, like a setting for it. Okay. And the idea then is that the director would have that to show their actors or to listen to while they're shooting. Mm. And then also later at the editing process, start to use that in the edit. Okay, so then let's talk about how you pick a project. So uh, do you pick projects based on the script? Do you pick it based on the directors? Do you, wh- What's your process? Yeah, so it's like, Places where you see that feel like you could be a value, basically yeah. a working process, and it's something that excites you and interests yeah. you. And what's your oral experience as you read a script? Is it uh, do you, do you wait for the conversation with the director to kind of even start playing around with those ideas, or do things just naturally come to you as you're reading? I think both both can happen. I mean, I think things can naturally from any any trigger point. In life, things can come to you musically and can start to to function in your mind as to what what a certain way of working with music might might work for anything. It can be really it depends on the quality of the script as well. If you're reading a very interesting script, it's very engaging and it's moving. You're moving with it, and it works very easily with you. You know, or it challenges you in some way. Then it's going to have. If it engages you like that, it's going to have an effect. Like for me, definitely. An interesting script can have an effect like that, where you'll be thinking of ideas, yeah. un- subconsciously, I mean, yeah. unintentionally. Yeah. Not that they necessarily have to make the film. Yeah, will ever get realized, but right. you know, give you colors and, and spaces that would would work. Yeah, you know? I think yeah, like first impressions are really important. So yeah. you end up being quite, uh, at least for me, you end up being like quite sensitive to what you're feeling. So even mm. if it if, even if it may not have an immediate musical realization. Um, 
it's also just experiencing a story for the first time and you're meeting all these mm. people for the first time, <clears throat> right? And so while you're doing that, you're, you you have this very strong and usually quite visceral reaction that then can, it's a, that, that's something you quite often return to when you're trying to think of what mm. the musical world for mm-hmm. that film might be. Mm. And so that's many things. That's like, okay, reading the script and thinking, okay, structurally, this film has, okay, is it a overall narrative kind of approach? Is it like a character-based approach? What, what, how is this film, how is mm. that script structured? So what kind of musical structure will complement that? You know, mm-hmm. Is it like a psychological thing where you're in with the people at the same time? Or is it something where you're stepping back? Mm-hmm. Or is it something where the music has to grab you and take you? Or is it something where the music's kind of invisible and just following people around? Is it yeah. very dramatic or is it very subtle? So immediately while you're reading it, you get these ideas of how the script uh, functions. Mm-hmm. And so then you start thinking about how music could function mm. in that. And also you just get an idea of like how it makes you feel. Mm. And then yeah. you, you kind of feel like that becomes a touchstone, especially with the first impression of like, okay, I want the music. The music has to feel like it belongs in in this in this in the same world with how that script made me feel. Mm. When you're writing the music, you're also thinking, is the music doing the same thing? Is it feeling like it's the same? You know, yeah. because film is ultimately like a direct. I mean, it's a writer's vision as well, but it's also like a director's vision. So you have to um, everything has to come together, and all these disparate departments have to come together and feel like they connect to one thing and many times that anchor is the script mm. as well as what the director's vision of that is so you have to have while you're always talking about a director and they're talking about what how they see something that first impression and that first emotional reaction reaction when you read something is also quite important so so if we take trial by fire as an example directed by prashant nair you guys had mentioned that you wrote something for it pre them ever yeah. going on floors. Yeah. So how did you all negotiate that song? How did you all come to that song? I mean, that piece of music. So. Yeah, yeah. There was a lot of discussion. Yeah. And we knew each other. Yeah. <coughs> we, we worked on yeah. a, a project before that. And so they're very inter- well and interestingly informed musically. They have a lot of ideas of their own and a lot of a lot of choices that they like to make and, and playing with a lot of interesting musical areas. And so we knew them, and so we could we could have a lot of very free and easy discussions about what might be required, and 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 also and look for what might be needed for this kind of potentially providing one piece, or maybe more in, in some cases, but in, in this uh, situation, one piece, which they would have beforehand, as our response to the script and to the discussions. Yeah. Um, so that was quite an easy process, in 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 at least triggering off how we go into the writing yeah. the writing process. I think, a cons- not a concern, but one thing that we wanted to be quite careful of with Trial by Fire was that since it was a show and right right from the first episode, you're jumping into like this very serious like amount of grief, you know, it's quite mm. like, it's deeply tragic about these parents who've lost their two children, right? Mm. The music was really going to set that emotional landscape. And what was something that we wanted to really be careful of was that that grief didn't really feel like something very slow or that you mm. felt it invoked a sense of pity mm. for the characters. Mm. Uh, but there was no rather, wallowing. Yeah, there was no wallowing. Zero like wallowing. Yeah, yeah. So it, you didn't want to invoke pity? Not not in a... Not in a wallowing Not way. in a wallowing kind of way, but like no... A, like a marsh or a swamp. Yeah, yeah that it that. feels like Those sad and you're swamp. spending this, you know, really... It's so the yeah. deep. So the idea was more to focus on like the more propulsive qualities of grief. Mm. You know, of how it becomes for them a, a, a mission, you know? Right. So the idea was that track, which we can show you, uh, it it, um, it had to have this level of pathos to it as well, mm-hmm. but it also needed to have a steeliness, um, mm-hmm. you know, which Neelam really embodies, as well as have like a propulsive quality. So you feel like you're not stuck in it, but that you're moving forward. Mm. Right. You know? Right. Um, I mean, when I was watching Trial by Fire, the way I wound up writing it down is that she had the clear blue clarity of grief, the exactly. ice blue clarity of grief, right. which yeah, is yeah. a single-mindedness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What instrument is the really high? That's the string harmonics. Okay. And Very that's what gives that. you more like emotional kind yeah. of like right. large yeah. quality. Romantic. It is mournful, but also yeah. scything. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So that's what. That's not like you're not like that wallowing. It's not like very lush. It's like there's yeah. a coldness and clarity to yeah. it. You know. Right. I do feel that. Sometimes I feel manipulated by a score, mm. Mm. whereas in this particular case, I I don't feel like I'm being. Told to feel something. Instead, yeah. I'm. Mm. It's like I'm on the hero's journey, mm. which is how I kind of 
saw it at, at certain moments, particularly with Neelam and Shekhar, mm. where it felt like it was sad, but it also was inevitable what is now to come. Mm. That they are now going to be <coughs> galvanized by mm. the events. Yeah. Did you talk at all with Prashant about how you want to treat Neelam and Shekhar? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think there was always a case of wanting to make sure that they had their dignity, right? Mm, right. In through this. So, like you were speaking of, like that manipulative quality of making it too sentimental mm. at any moment. Correct. That was something we really wanted to avoid. Avoid all that. I mean, you all costs. that yeah, from the beginning. Yeah. So, I mean, there were a lot of these moments where you could very, it, it was quite, it's, it's, we wanted to give it that sense of scale and purpose and that driving quality, but you needed to find a way to balance that without making it sentimental. Mm. Yeah, you know, which is what I meant when I said pity as well. Which is you don't want to rob them of their dignity in these moments. And I think just in general, as a as a as an approach to scoring that we've always had, is that, you know, and especially in a show like this where you have such strong performances and it's put together so well, is that the whole point of music being there in a the scene is that it should be doing something that wouldn't have happened otherwise. Mm. And if there is already that level mm. of drama and there's mm. that level of tenderness and compassion already happening, give it that space. Yeah. And it's always you feel like if you if that you have to let an, an you know give audience their dignity as well and they yeah. treat them intelligently yes. too yeah. because that it's so much more powerful in a moment where if an audience makes that last step right they take that last step on their own right but it's not like I'm telling you what to do I'm mm. taking you then you make that yeah you connect the dots mm. then they're really with you then you're with you and you yeah it's, it's an active experience yeah. Yeah. you're putting it to there you're with people you you know but if you're making it excessively emotional if you're making everything that's already there even more abundantly clear, mm. you're telling people I don't want you to participate. Yeah. Right. And then it's just not you don't you don't earn those moments when you're watching something. It's not as powerful. You know? yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Have there been times where you have to kind of find a compromise where you all want to be slightly more subtle, but a director wants a little bit more, or uh, you know? Yeah, it, yeah. You know, I mean, sometimes it's it's yeah. it. What's so great about a collaborative process is it's also sometimes really just quite surprising. Where you would have said, okay, no, we really need to, someone will, mm. you might feel, or the director might feel, or you, you know, or vice versa, you might feel, okay, this is a moment that you really want to step back from. Mm. And someone may have a gut, in, you know, intuitive instinct or a gut instinct, like, no, we can really do something special here. Mm. And then you do something and you realize you're wrong. Yeah. And, uh, and it well, works. It, 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 it works, you know. Mm. So there's definitely that, those forays into the unknown, mm. which also mm. make it quite enjoyable. Right. But, uh, Okay, so mm. you read the script, yeah. you get feelings, you yeah. discuss with the director, yeah. you have more feelings yeah. um, and ideas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You compose this track mm. through yeah. those discussions. Yeah. Mm. All right. What are the next steps? In the, in the overall... In uh, this particular case, this was a pre... Yeah, which is actually track. quite unusual. Uh, right. I mean, yeah. we try and push for that as much as we can because the normal process which happens, which is what we try and avoid as much as possible, is... Um, even if you may have had these discussions and you may be aware of what's coming, is usually then after everyone's, you know, shot whatever they're shooting, there's, there's the editing process, mm -hmm. and then while they're editing uh, and putting the editors or editor and the director are working together and they're putting everything together, then they usually use what's called temp music, mm -hmm. which they use existing pieces of score or music or songs or whatever from that that have been made before, and they edit with that to give both the editor feeling the right kind of pace as well as that kind of feeling and, and you know, more for those specific moments. Mm. It may not have, sometimes it has an overall language which is built in with the choices of pieces, but sometimes it also just might be whatever piece works for that particular moment because it's got the right kind of mood and it's got the right kind of pace. Mm. Mm. So then once that, that rough cut or that edit has happened with those temp pieces of music in, then it comes to us. Um, we watch it with the director either in terms of scenes or you watch it as a full film or a full episode or whatever it might be. And then you have another discussion because you've obviously felt things can change quite radically or at least change in some way or shape and form from what it was like on the page to what it is like in, you know, since it's been shot and then finally once it's edited. What you do is usually what's called spotting, which you watch the entire episode or, or film and you decide where music should be. Okay, these are the, these are the places which need music and then you discuss what should be happening and what you'd like, the director would like or what we'd also feel mm. the music should do in that moment. And then through that, you try and put it all together and, and build like an overall vision or structure for the entire um, thing, which, uh, which might be, okay, we need, um, which you'd be talking about like things that we just discussed, which is like the musical language, what is the mood of this entire thing, like we've discussed here. Mm. Um, and also like, what is the structure for this? Uh, what kind of music comes where? 
Do we want very different kinds of music or do we need just one kind of music or do we need many kinds of themes? Are the themes going to be character based where you're following an individual around or they're going to be more like narrative based where you're following how the whole story comes together? Mm. And usually you try and avoid the temp as much as possible and throw it out and forget it. But what can unfortunately happen in a creative working process is that if there's been a piece of music that's just been put together with a visual for a certain amount of time, mm. they just start to fuse, mm. you know? Mm. So then it can, be, it can be quite a challenging process because also maybe the edit's been constructed in a very specific way around a specific piece of music that's quite in, idiosyncratic. So if you want to get that edit structure working the, in, in exactly the same thing, you're, you have to take maybe even just the tempo or something mm. from that piece mm. of music that's the same. Otherwise, the edit will not work. Mm. So we try and make that process as symbiotic as possible, where either there's a chance for the edit to change mm. a little bit after whatever we may have done with the music, or, which is what we've done earlier, is that you compose the music prior, so that then, like, which is what happened with Travel Fire, this piece of music was used in the edit. Right. In many, in many places. I think in 2001, A Space Odyssey just never took away his temp tracks. Was it 2001? Yeah. No. I believe so. No, it was also The Shining, uh, but he did the same. And with The Shining, he'd, he'd got uh, Wendy Carlos on board. Yeah. And, uh, and he'd got all this Penderet key yeah. and all of this in the, in the, uh, in the ref. And he just, he couldn't, uh, he, couldn't part, yeah. he couldn't let go of it. So he, yeah. they didn't use much of the Wendy Carlos score, it's mostly yeah. that. Yeah. And actually Kubrick was not a very nice man. Yeah. He didn't mm. pay for any of this. So the Ligeti and everything, yeah. even though Ligeti said like, he loved how the music was used in 2001. Yeah. It's like, I think it, Paid. Oh, <laughs> no, 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 no. He didn't license it. Oh, yeah, if I'm okay. not mistaken, I check okay. it. But yeah, yeah. It I didn't, until much later, it got sorted, but Kubrick just went ahead and did it. <laughs> yeah, I know in 2001, the composer has come to the film realizing that none of his music is in it and he's just gone with all the temp tracks that he had put there as placeholders. Yeah. He just loved them too much. He just got too used to them, like what you're yeah. saying. Like I mean, the yeah, it works melding. really well with Kubrick, but yeah. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 At least tell him so he doesn't turn up. You know what I mean? <laughs> Don't let me turn up. So, so we were along the steps of the process of making it, right? Mm. You yeah. read the script, you talk with the director, you sometimes compose music prior, sometimes not, depending on the project mm. and the relationship with the director. Do you collaborate with anybody else during the pre-production stage? Not usually, but we're trying to do as much of that as we can. Um, again, we just find that usually these things help Mm. inform some choices directly and some more, some, you know, indirectly. So, like, for example, on Trial by Fire, we've, uh, um, there were many things that happened that were really different from, from a lot of other projects. One is how we set up the project, which I think we'll talk about in, when we're looking at a scene specifically as well. But the idea was to try and separate how sound and music you know, usually siloed off in a working process. So even though they both contribute to the entire oral landscape of a project, um, they usually, uh, we don't usually really meet each other mm. until um, the final last stages of a project. So like you'd mentioned, there's the pre-production, uh, there's the shooting, there's the editing, then there's the post-production that starts, which is that when it comes to us, and at the same time it comes to us, it usually goes to the sound design team. Mm then we're usually working at separate points in time. So mm. we're composing the music and they're doing all the sound design, which is like cleaning up all the dialogue, as well as adding all the effects and ambiances and Foley and so on and so forth. And then it meets at a, what's called a premix stage, where you have all of those different elements that, are come, to, that come together and they're sort of balanced out. And then you have a final mix which is where all of those elements are like with the director and with everyone. You get the, f the ways the volume of each individual element is rising or falling or, you know, sit, how the, the ways they're made to sit together. Mm. Uh, it's expensive both in terms of time because you're getting quite close to finishing it. So there's not really that much chance for creative exploration because you have a very tight deadline, quick, very quick turnaround. And they're usually happening at quite like expensive facilities. So each hour counts quite a lot. Mm -hmm. So because of those two factors, what ends up happening there is that you may have like scenes where sound and music are firing on all cylinders at the same time. You know, which in a very, in a very obvious way you could talk about like say with a car chase or an action sequence, you know. Or in more, you know, subliminal ways, smaller ways, it could be even just how you realize in the overall pacing of a thing when all these elements have come together because when you're listening to music on its own, 
It's a very different experience, even if you have like a very rough sound design, to when the whole sonic landscape is full. Mm. You may have an emotional moment with a character that works beautifully without music, right? Or you, because just the way the ambience and the way everything else is happening, the way the whole sound design is added to that scene, says everything you already need to say. So maybe you need to tone down that piece a whole lot. Mm. Or the opposite, you had a scene which was, which we, suddenly when everything's come together is not quite holding and you might need some music there for whatever reason. So what we try to do with this project is right from the, the get, which is before we even started, uh, you know, even before the film started, the, the series started shooting, sound and, and, and music were one team. Mm. So Anirban, who was the sound designer, and Boloy, who was the mixing engineer, we all had pre-production meetings where we all were already talking. We got like an idea of what the, how the show was going to be planned. We had an idea of, we were already thinking about how the timeline of the whole show would work, but also all the creative discussions. And then in this room, uh, which is a final mix room, we, we were composing as well as uh, doing the sound design at the same time. So we'd work separately from each other, but we'd every day share material. So there was no surprise moment of mix. So the idea was to try and say, okay, instead of mix being this last process where we already meet and very quickly have to take these decisions together, let's start seeing how these inter uh, these uh, different elements intermingle and interact right from the get. Mm -hmm. You know, so they're always mixing. Mm -hmm. So if there's any moment like the scene that we'll go through later, which is the opening of of the the first episode, where you have a lot going on, you can find really subtle ways where you can start exchanging one hand from the from you know, one thing to the next. Mm. And in that process, we knew, for example, that we were, we were before we started shooting, um, Somo, Swaminanda Sahi, who shot the series, mm. and Prashant gave us the entire lookbook. So we had an idea of like, even the visual color palette, yeah. palette of, the, of the show. And these things are great to like to let percolate earlier because you get even when oh, we're yeah. writing we're, we're writing that theme you know what it's going to look like you know the colors of the show right mm -hmm. even if you don't know um, what the visual shot breakdown is or anything like that yeah you know what the the, the, the character the vibe is you know what the approach is yeah so huge. there's yeah. there's when you when you hit the ground running and you're all together everyone's on the same page everyone's like you know all the departments are like thinking the same thing yeah um, and then even while they were shooting I think a big challenge that Somo spoke of is like. Because they were shooting period in Delhi, and sometimes you can't get, you can't quite get the locations or the places, or you know, it, what ended up happening. Also, uh, one reason was that, and the other was just the overall visual languages. Everything was shot in a lot of closes. Mm -hmm. so one is that creates a psychological experience yeah. that the score has to support, yeah. and the other is that the sonic world of the sh the show starts to really become its setting because you're not seeing it. You're not seeing Delhi in the 90s. Right. You have to hear Delhi in the 90s. Mm. So then we knew very early on, we knew before we'd even gotten one, one edit or one minute of footage, we knew that the sound of the show had to do this. So then you have to get those sounds, you have to get, you know, you have to deep dive and find all the vehicles and all these various things and you know that we have to also exaggerate that slightly even if it's subliminal or, you know. Yeah, so then sound has to do that, right? You have to build that world and you have to make it believable. Mm. But this is a luxury, this doesn't usually it's happen, a, but it's somewhere you want to work in the future. Absolutely, yeah. and it's, yeah. it's, it's a luxury not... It's not really, it's not got to do with the luxury with it being an expensive process. It's yeah. just something that's unusual. It's just something that takes... Uh, it's only because it takes time uh, and it takes a certain logistical uh, yeah. way of planning it. Yeah. That it's set up that way. Yeah. Um, but if that can happen, it's ideal. It's yeah. really ideal because then you have a you have a collaboration and like this osmosis between departments that really can transform and gives you a sense of craft. You can achieve a sense of craft, uh, which has not got to do with the talent or the ability of anyone involved. It's just mm -hmm. got to do with communication mm -hmm. and you know of everyone working together with long with, en with enough time to to mm -hmm. achieve what mm -hmm. they need to. Yeah. How many constraints are there budget wise usually? Is it something that you really have to wrestle with in the beginning? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 usually, always, yeah, always, <laughs> always yeah. yeah. We come from in working yeah. primarily first starting off with independent film. Yeah. Where the idea of I mean the word yeah. budget was didn't yeah. exist. There was no budget for budget. <laughs> mm. <laughs> because and also because some of these things that you look at are intangible, right? I mean they're yeah. not they're not as easily identifiable as like, oh, it's value for money, yeah. Mm. So yeah. I mean it's something that's happened yeah. since the if you look at film history and also also the history of Bollywood, um, it's something that happened since the 80s, right? As soon as you started having electronic instruments come in more and more, mm. you had live music falling out. So drum machines started replacing percussion sections, keyboards started replacing string orchestras, mm -hmm. you know, and then you had synthesizers that would just replace every musician ever, right? Mm -hmm. So then it, it's, yeah. 
it's it's wonderful because it's it's I grew up with that. I mean, I grew up with that liberation that in my computer and in my bedroom I could have an orchestra and an entire the entire musical world at at, at your fingertips. You can create anything, and that's for in terms of the the palette you have to experiment with. That's amazing, but there is a certain quality that can only come through some mm. through another person interpreting that interpreting that piece of music and yeah. you're actually playing it and you're hearing it live. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But that's expensive. Yeah. Right? Mm. To get a whole bunch of live music and especially when a producer knows and they have a bottom line that they're really trying to like, you know, trying to hit that um they know that you can do it all on your computer in your bedroom. Yeah. And without a dime extra. And then you're only paying for the intangibles which is that creative yeah thing. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Mm. So then Yeah, it's always a struggle to yeah. yeah. So you need usually champions on your side whether it's a director or a producer or someone in the working process who sees the value of like okay, for example, we try let's let today we try and figure out how we can get live involved, yeah. How can we really get an orchestra yeah. involved? Right. And that before and after with an orchestra with certain parts of music is yeah. night and day. Right, and I guess it adds that other thing that you were talking about which is the raw human quality of people feeling their way through it. Yeah. And mm-hmm. what that brings that is different from just sitting i guess at a laptop and designing it yeah, yeah. so that and it's 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 the the breadth of and quality of sound it yeah. will just be different you know if you, if you you can you can mock up a a 50 60 70 piece orchestra yeah. can sound fantastic to some extent with software but it won't sound the same as 50 60 70 piece live orchestra you yeah. know just because of real people playing it acoustics how it works how Real it works when it records yeah. the instruments the instrument qualities all the different instruments that you're recording all the different microphones and, and it's also placing the whole it's also not just know. sonics there are there are things that you can play that mm. you just can't do in a computer yeah that's true that's true There's a Can't there's an articulation that's yeah, yeah. just not Absolutely. there yeah. in your instrument. In fact, to be very honest, you can only get a really quite a small fraction of the way towards what you can do on the instrument. Yeah. Okay. With most software, you can't get close to how you can manipulate a, a wooden instrument from from my experience or thing. Okay. You can't get really close. They have really good there are really good ways of working with software, but it doesn't the 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 liberation of having real hands on the strings mm-hmm. is another thing entirely, you know. Right. And there's a reason why people spend 25 years studying to be a violinist or whatever they do, you know. Yeah. Because they can do this and you can't, you know, mm. you've got, a, a, you've got a, a finite number of options with your mm-hmm. software. And it's also it's also super most of the resources also like focused towards a certain kind of film composition so the tools you get are mm. usually mostly geared towards a certain kind of sound mm. and a mm. certain yeah. uh, cultural <laughs> thing of sound so yeah. for example you're not going to find very good indian instruments mm. and you're not going to find things that are they can play articulations that are more middle eastern or indian or chinese or anything you know that's non western mm. it's 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 harder to find and it's certainly like an authentic sarangi for example right if it exists i have never found it i don't know mm. you know you don't get instruments that sound good that way you might find an authentic decent sounding violin mm. that can do basics mm. but extended technique on a violin no because that's also not used as often so if you're going to go off into the deep end and do some things that are really unique or sound mm. different or not super conventional sounding you're probably not going to be able to get that as easily in a yeah. software instrument yeah i mean the 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 uh, the the funny thing there as well is that you're absolutely right about the extended thing but actually where you also see the red flag is with the really simple solo stuff yeah yeah as well because the, you can't if you ask someone to play a solo cello part a, a simple lovely thing It, you know that's where you really highlight what you can't do yeah. with software it's like you, you put a section together maybe you can you can you can blur over the lines and create something possible mm. but actually get someone to just play you know a very very simple line and it will sound it, it won't sound like a human's playing it 
because it's you're programming every note and it's a very simple line, so you can hear the crossing of how how these notes happen. You know? Yeah, and the, the mm. limitations of whatever technical, yeah. uh, however that software is technically set up. It's recorded that way. Yeah. So, yeah. And then usually what you end up having to do is you have to if to put some dressing around it, mm. sonic dressing around it. Mm. So sometimes <laughs> when you're working, when you're working with cover your tracks. So. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Literally, uh, when you're uh, uh, working with like a soloist, or when you're working with live musicians, <coughs> you can actually uh, you don't have to do as much. You you can do a whole lot. You don't have to embellish a whole lot because mm -hmm. there's so much vibrancy and so much that comes through just the playing of that instrument that it can mm -hmm. just stand out on its own, and that's really powerful, you know. Mm -hmm. the, of, of you know something, you can achieve a certain uh, level, yeah. Of, like yeah, simplicity and power with that. Mm -hmm. That's not possible. Elegance of that is not possible. How do you decide instrumentation? How do you decide which instruments to use or why? Um, I think that varies depending on where you land with your chats with like a in that that pre decision making discussion. I mean the the, the, the thought process like with this, like you were talking about with the kind of blue um, steel steely kind of idea of clarity here, you know, we fell down to a, a place which references something like a Baroque or classical um, sacred work, like a, like a, a chorale or a, something from a Stabat Mater or a Requiem. And in, in a lot of those works, you know, you can find these moments of extreme clarity with strings and voice, you know, okay. very clear cut parts and harmonies. And it wasn't that, that this is based on a sacred piece of music, but it's more like referencing what those pieces of music do, which kind of give you that. Um, there's an element of, like Noreen was saying, that of potentially of sadness and pathos whilst having determination and clarity and focus, extreme focus. Mm -hmm. So this, the string parts in here are all very still. There's no vibrato. Mm -hmm. There's no playing around with the string parts. They're absolutely clear cut. Quite high. Yeah, and very high and very, and that's it. You know, and they just do this, they do what they're supposed to do and they repeat and they carry on. Yeah. And that was quite deliberate. There's okay. no, there's none of this kind of lush, yeah. you know, right idea, which nothing to do with historical musicality, musicology, like coming a century later, but so it's not to do with that, but it's definitely to do with uh, a sort of clarity that we were thinking about. Yeah, and there's a steeliness okay. that comes from harmonics yeah. as well. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Sort of a crystal thing. Okay. If you're layering all of these tracks together, like just now there were two different strains of piano happening simultaneously. Mm. Yeah. So <clears throat> just tell me a bit about that process, because I really know nothing. You just start layering, don't you? Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. You, you start. It's like putting yeah. things on top of each yeah, other. Yeah, yeah. It's like painting. You put yeah. various things on one, then you add something yeah. else. So what software do you usually use? Oh, for writing, it's usually logic. Okay. Yeah. Mm. But it and, could be anything. Really. And then for the layering, it all happens within Logic? Yeah. 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 Okay. So what other equipment is required in order to produce, let's say, this Scratch track? This was then like you have some software at work in certain instruments, which... Yeah. So you have what's on. called yeah, a DAW, or yeah. like a digital audio workstation. Yeah. Okay. Which could be what we have in the background, which is Pro Tools, which is our final mix for this project. Mm -hmm. yeah. Or you have Logic, which is like a board. Mm. It's a compositional kind of tool. Okay. And then in this in this particular track, to just get a just like a rough demo idea, some of it was happening in real time, as well as layering some of your digital work, because I have access to string instruments and putting stuff down. Mm -hmm. So then obviously you need a microphone and a sound card, and you just sit down and go mm -hmm. and start. If you, you can do that through either knowing what you're going to write already, mm -hmm. or you can do that through experimentation and discovering as you go along. Yeah. So that layering process can go many Very different good. ways. Yeah. Can go through a process of like a complete experimentation of like, yeah. oh, why don't I throw this? Or let me yeah. just, you can challenge yourself you, and say, yeah. 
I would normally put a piano here. Mm. In, in this case, that made a lot of sense. But in, in another case, I might be like, I would normally put a piano here, but I'm going to deliberately challenge myself and do something else and yeah. see by by going stepping off into something unknown what happens. Mm. Or it could be like, no, this is I know that this track needs strings and this and this and this. So yeah. I'm going to stick within that wheelhouse and find the various colors that I might need to. Mm. So you, I mean, I think you try and find many ways for that process to be interesting for yourself. And sometimes it's mm. dictated by what you want to experiment with on that day, what you're feeling, what the subject matter is. Mm. It's also, I think, you know, like say with, with this piece or anything else, also sometimes you get an idea in early chats, which we might have or you have with a director or anything like that of like, this is the musical universe I want to set something in. Mm. And that has a precedence, right? Because then, okay, I mm. want to make a funk track. Mm. Or no, I want to make a chorale mm. or, you know, reference, you know, yeah. masters and requiems and things like that that have been written in the past. Mm. So then you know that there is each of those different musical worlds mm. have a language of their own. They have a style of their own. So you know that, okay, mm. if you're writing a, you know, a, a, you know, a funk track, it's yeah. going to have this kind of harmony. It's going to have this kind of bass part. It's going to have these kind of horn parts, maybe uh, these mm. kind of drum parts. So then you know that, okay, you're building on the shoulders or whatever you may have liked or find interesting. Oh, I'm going to put these different genres together. Mm. So there's also like, a conceptual underpinning that you're yeah. using as a as an anchor or a reference. It's like how many times I'm sure you felt this as well. Like when you walk away from a film, mm. there's one thing that sticks with you sonically with that film, mm. right? Because it just feels like it connects. Mm. So whether you're, I mean, I mean, very stereotypical examples would be like, you know, everyone remembers those high strings from Psycho, mm. yeah, or something like that. So you want to find something where that musical identity for mm. that moment just feels like. It could be nothing else. Mm -hmm. For that film, for that project, it could be no other clothing but mm. the, this music, you know? Right. Um, so, it's that impending sense of doom in Jaws. Mm. Right. right? Mm. Uh, you know, any of these things that, okay, this all, all the floaty, ethereal sins of the evangelist in, in Blade Runner, mm -hmm. you know? Um, mm. Each one of, or like, you know, how classical music is used in um, Apocalypse Now. Mm -hmm. You know, like, any of these things, you can't, anytime you hear that piece of music, it's forever associated with it's that, true. with those images. Mm -hmm. And the same thing is when you watch that scene, you'll always hear that music. So yeah. the goal is as a composer is to try and say, okay, what is that perfect meld for you, mm -hmm. for everyone, for all collaborators, that it's speaking to the soul, to the characters, to the larger narrative world, to the thematic mm -hmm. ideas of what the film's trying to portray. Like all of those just kind of like fuse completely and perfectly. For example, if I am uh, up and coming or I want to be a composer mm. and I'm younger, right? I, I look at the setup and I think, wow, that's like leagues ahead of me. So is there anything you have to say about starting out and the kind of equipment you had then? Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, actually, even when I started out, I, used to, I was quite obsessed with, uh, you know, especially with film, which is such a large enterprise. I was thinking that you'd need all of these things to sound good and you'd need all of these various plugins and this various stuff and unless I had XYZ, I wouldn't be able to make ABC and so on and so forth. Then, if, despite, I mean, this is a this is a Final Mix studio, so obviously there's a lot of other things, but when you're just composing, you actually don't need anything. Uh, you just need, you need a, a way to play back video and your audio at the same time. So you need a DAW that can handle that, a computer that can handle that DAW, which right now can be almost anything. Yeah. And yeah, a... Uh, uh, there are some pieces of software that you need that are better suited towards video. Mm. You don't have to use them, but they might help you, like Logic or Cubase or so on and so forth. Um, and you just need plugins that can make sound and a way to make sound out of those plugins. So if you're a keyboard player, it might help to have a keyboard, but you don't need that either. If you're an instrumentalist where you'd like to record yourself, then you need a mic and yeah. a reasonably quiet place to record or work in. Um, and that's, that's, that's kind of about yeah. it. Yeah. So we'd, 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 we'd work on multiple tracks. Early on, we were all working out of our bedrooms mm -hmm. on very, very basic systems with like, yeah, super, yeah, super basic everything. And we'd do early versions of tracks, which were just us playing in our bedroom with very basic, like the most rudimentary mic possible. Mm. And at that point, oh, it's our first big film, you know, it's like this big scale, it's going to the Venice Film Festival, you can't make it sound amazing. We'd go try and get the budget and we'd go and record with someone in a, in a proper, you know, what we thought was a proper studio and yeah. get it all proper sorted and then, Realize, like at the end, like you know, there was something about that first performance. Mm. Yeah, there was yeah. something about that thing yeah. that none of these other things captured. And I think it was also capturing our, us being so intimidated by those other spaces mm. that we weren't as free and open and experimenting as the same way we would in our bedroom. Yeah. Uh, but so then 
at the end, the, the, the final version is like yeah. that first scratch. Right. Like, yeah. for example, even later in, in, in Newton, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Ben is not a guitar player normally, you know, mm-hmm. but he. <laughs> <laughs> but he Give me the guitar. Yeah. <laughs> right. So he sort of recorded a chord outline for the, for yeah. the song. Uh, there's a song that plays in the middle. <laughs> and in our minds, we were like, well, who is going to replace this? Yeah, I mean, it's some banging and then, guitarist to come in. Yeah, so we get some, we'll get a professional, you know to come in or we'll record it properly. We couldn't cut them up. With a really good cut. <laughs> we didn't even try. We didn't need to. Because no. there was something about so, that that just felt, kind of dumb. That felt yeah. right. Yeah, right. so I it's don't like, know. Like a garage band that becomes mainstream and loses something. Loses that right. fun or um, that raw yeah. element. Yeah, yeah. Or just that you don't need to be intimidated <laughs> by the, the making yeah. of. You can, you, can, you can do it if you want with a, you know, everything, but it's also really actually quite freeing and liberating. It's also just really possible with anything. Yeah. I mean, there's, uh, there's something about... And we learned that the hard way. So, yeah. Like, yeah. This, I remember Ship of Theseus, for example, was all done uh, in, in our bedrooms. And um, mostly also all done, we didn't have decent enough speakers, and also all done on one set of headphones. And I was so uh, insecure about like how it was sounding that I know it. I knew it sounded nice on the headphones, but I was like, okay, now it's the end of the film and we're going to a professional mix engineer that I'm going to give all the tracks completely raw and start the mixing process up from scratch. And those first two days of mix went horribly with one of the uh, later mixing engineers. And it was just like, then I just realized that, no, I, what we had worked. Yeah. Mm. And what we had was fine. Mm. And yeah. we just needed to take that and make it a bit, you know, polish it a bit. Yeah. And, and it was done. Yeah. Um, later, like a, 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 a mix engineer told me about what he'd referred to as a programmer's mix, which is that first instinctive balance you have when you're putting all your instruments together. Mm-hmm. Is there's something in it that just yeah. happens instinctively that's just correct. That's just right. Because yeah, yeah. You, like you were saying, you can't recreate the feeling because in that moment you're writing the music, you're feeling it in your core in, in a way that you might mm. not tap into mm. as easily or as strongly later. Mm. Um, so it's it's important to capture that and to honor it, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, that took a long time to. Yeah. If you had any uh, advice for up and coming or people that want to be composers, film composers, I mean, yeah, it's yeah. like I think the, one of uh, Bennett's composition teachers said something which I really liked, which is just that when in, in terms of writing process, which is that you write what you want to hear. Yeah, and pa- parting parting advice. Yeah, to a few of us. College, just write what you want to hear. <laughs> <laughs> Left it. <laughs> it's not a very simple yeah, message, but sometimes just, it can like really right. cut through the fog. Yeah. Like ultim- it's a tricky thing because people, so many people, and so many young people, who who have great talents to come up with ideas, whether they've got a certain training or don't have a certain training or a different kind of musical training, almost. You know, you, you know the people I've always found working with musicians, mm-hmm. both contemporaries and younger people, that. If you want to make some something, that you'll make something. Mm. If you're interested in being creative, as it were, being creative and making stuff and musicking and these things, you will do stuff. Part of it, I suppose, as film composers, is how do you get from saying, "Well, I've made all this stuff," yeah. to the, how does that get into film? Apart from the small practicalities, can you meet a a dance troupe who needs some music making? Maybe can you find a small, interesting short theater film. company yeah. or a, theater, a short film who? Yeah. You know what? Well, chuck some of my music in there, or I'll work with you, or collaborate on it, or something. Yeah. Um, musically speaking, I think people who want to make music will make music. Mm. You know, I've always, uh, whether you're coming from the Western classical, or Hindustani classical, or zero and punk, or you, metal, it doesn't really matter. No, you'll no. just make stuff. Mm. From music, thing for me would be like uh, there's a really nice video online on YouTube with Bill Evans. It's the creative process itself, teaching mm. self learning or something, which is really nice. Mm. Where he talks about, um, in the same way of like, write what you 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 want to hear. It's also knowing what, knowing where you are musically, and he talks about like, um, approximating the size of the problem, of of like what he talks about as a problem. It's like okay, this is where I want to be, and this is where I am, mm. and knowing how far that is, and enjoying. Mm. First, being re- building on what you know and not building on like trying to do all the things you can't. So focus on what you really can do and find simple creative or strong creative expression with what you know and then like taking joy in that every small step you take as you're going to wherever you need to get to. Mm. Um, but um, I'd say for industry and working here, the big thing would be is like, especially early on, so much of uh, 
your job is waiting. And it's waiting between, between things, you know, mm. between one project to the next. And I think what really can end up changing how you grow and how you end up working is what you, how you wait. Mm. So mm. it's like, how do you spend that time waiting? You mm. know? And how, what are you doing while you wait? And it's really important to, to find whatever that might be for you and to make that something constructive that's taking you in a direction. Um, and yeah, it's like, there's nothing like practical experience. So like mm. Bennett was saying, it could be for projects that are new, but it could be like, I have, I have nothing to do. I'm going to rescore Star Wars. Mm. I'm just going to take Star Wars and just make my own score for it. Whatever. Or take this ad, mm. or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And also like, I know I'm really, really solid with orchestral music, but I don't know electronic music at all. So I'm going to do mm. con. You know, I'm going to do like a mm -hmm. techno score now for this film. How do I do it? I don't know. Let me find out. Oh, I, the other way around. But just finding fun ways to challenge yourself. So that also when that moment comes, you're not rusty, you know, you've been working. And mm. also you just take, take joy in the daily and yeah. the routine of just doing things. Exactly. Of getting up in the morning and, you know, Hemingway used to talk about it. Like the most important thing of being a writer is like sitting at a desk. Yeah. yeah. That's it. Mm. You may put out one word or you may put out 800, it doesn't matter. Mm. But just get, get there, there, get there mm. and just mm. start and do it yeah. and just do it regularly. Yeah. I think it's also just about like finding ways to keep it fun. Mm, yeah. You know? Like there was this really nice interview with uh, uh, Jamie Liddell and Eamon Tobin where they were talking about, Eamon Tobin was talking about gear and so many times people like, everyone like everyone who likes equipment gets into this thing of whatever gas or whatever gear acquisition syndrome or like loving buying pieces of equipment or mm -hmm. this new little thing. And many times it's vaulted as like, oh, this analog thing has a filter that sounds better in this specific way. And Eamon Tobin was like, it's also a toy. Mm. And there's also, like a kid, it's fun to have new toys. Mm. Yeah. And it's fun to have things to play with. Right. So whatever that might be for you, just like having, might not mean buying and spending money on things or whatever, yeah. but what, what it, how do you keep that sense of play and mm. fun? Uh, exploration. Uh, exploration, yeah. always like, new for you. It might change. One day it might mean one thing, one day, it, several years later, it might mean a completely different thing, but I think it's always important to try and find some way to keep that alive. It has been absolutely lovely talking to both of you gents. Look out for the deep dive that they're going to do on the opening of Trial by Fire and look out for the rest of their work. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs>